Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida IFAS Extension Service in Hernando County, Florida. And I'm here today with Dr. Alan Chambers, who is our guest speaker, and he's going to be talking about vanilla orchids and how to grow them. Um, this class is part of our ongoing virtual class series on how people can produce more of their own food at home for fun and profit and to help improve their own personal family's um, food system and to also become more sustainable. So we, have a, we offer a lot of different classes. You can go online to Hernando Extension, all one word, dot com, and see a full listing of all of our upcoming classes. And I'll go ahead and put that link in the chat box also. Like I mentioned earlier before we started recording, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box and we'll save them up till the very end. And that way we can go ahead and go through all of them. We are recording today's class. So I will email that out to everybody who registered for today's class. And we will put that back on our Facebook page also. I'll go ahead and put a link to our Facebook page in the chat box in a few minutes also. So if you wanna go ahead and visit our Facebook page and like it and follow it, that would be great. That's the best way to keep on top of what we're doing and all of our upcoming classes on edible crops and Florida friendly landscape crops. And we do classes on pretty much everything. So um, with that, let me go ahead and very, very briefly introduce uh, Dr. Chambers here. I'm gonna let him explain exactly what he does for University of Florida. But Dr. Alan Chambers is an assistant professor and he works at the University of Florida's Tropical Research and Education Center down in Homestead, Florida, which I've been to before. And he works with genetics and breeding of tropical fruits. So he works with things like mangoes and bananas, papayas, vanilla, which we're covering today, strawberries, passion fruit, avocados. So I think I'm definitely gonna to have to invite him to come back and talk about a few of those other crops at some point in the future. So follow all of our upcoming classes and you'll probably see him back on here again. So Dr. Chambers, let me go ahead and turn it over to you. It's all yours. All right, thank you, Bill. Hopefully you guys can hear me now. Uh, pleasure to be here. Can I get a confirmation from Bill that my audio is coming through? Yeah, I can hear you, you're fine. Okay, perfect. All right, so excited to spend just a couple minutes uh, with you all today uh, to talk about uh, some of our work with vanilla orchids. So my program, um, I am, as Bill said, at the Tropical Research and Education Center south of Miami. And the goal of my program is to develop new varieties of tropical fruits. Uh, I have an 80% research, 20% extension split. So I don't teach classes, but mostly I do research and I work with extension agents and growers and uh, the general public and community members. Um, like Bill said, there's a number of different species we work on. Part of the opportunities down in Southern Florida uh, include the fact that our growers are diversified. And so instead of having a single crop and large acreage, a lot of our growers down here are smaller acreage, growing a number of different crops. And so my program, trying to have the greatest impact possible, uh, spans a number of different species, as you can see here. Uh, but of course, vanilla and mango are probably my two favorites, though, we do a lot of site projects uh, for other species as well. So when we think about what, what we should be growing, uh, especially commercially, um, we think about the constraints we have in Florida. And this, this is a picture just north of Miami as I was flying in from a conference one night. And the dark patch uh, towards the top of the screen is the Everglades. And then the dark patch at the lower part of the screen is the Atlantic Ocean. And so we start thinking about the role of agriculture. And if we wanna keep agriculture viable, we think about the types of crops that are going to keep people in business should they choose to produce, produce food. And vanilla is one of those candidates that has extremely high appeal, global, global appeal, near insatiable demand, and is extremely high value in terms of a crop. 
Um, and while this might not look like your part of Florida, every area of Florida has its own challenges, whether it's water or weather or uh, whatnot. So we look at the, the value of, of vanilla um, by acre. So this is, there we go, get rid of that. Um, this is the, the, the gross value per acre. And so this doesn't take into account costs, labor, things like that. But for sure in, in our area, vanilla has the potential to be the highest grossing agricultural commodity that we've looked at so far. And um, this is a relatively conservative estimate. And like most other crops, there are certain um, estimates you have to make and even some guesses that go into these calculations. But vanilla has a high potential for income generation in South Florida. Um, and mostly the growing region depends on uh, low temperatures in the winter. And we'll get into that. So a little bit of the history of vanilla, which I think is, is a lot of fun. So this is the, the first botanical notice of vanilla. Uh, for those of you who, who know Latin, I guess, is what this is. Um, going back to the early 1600s, uh, where it was first being described in some of these botanical texts. Um, here's an example of one of the first uses of vanilla. This was published in the mid 1600s, and the red uh, highlighted word there is uh, chocolate. So this is where they were already pairing vanilla and chocolate, making one of our absolute favorite uh, desserts of all time. This is the first image of vanilla planifolia. Um, this is done by Andrews um, in 1808, as it says at the bottom, showing vanilla, which is a vine as an, and an orchid. Um, it's got a thick stem, it's a succulent plant, and then here with uh, the flowers and uh, the tendril aerial roots. Uh, no beans shown here, um, but Andrews was the first one for a record that we have uh, for vanilla planifolia, the primary commercial species. Uh, in the New World, it was used by Aztec nobles. Uh, it was reported in herbal remedies to that area, um, fabled uh, Montezuma, the Aztec emperor, used vanilla in his chocolatiel drink, for which he consumed copious amounts. It was cultivated um, as far back as the uh, mid-1700s um, by native people in the Mexican Central America area, and then uh, rediscovered or discovered, at least by the West, by Cortez, where he was served um, this chocolatiel drink in a golden goblet. Uh, the Spaniards called it vanilla, which means little pod, which is where the genus and name originates, we believe, today, which is vanilla. So vanilla, the commercial species, comes from our area of the world, so uh, southern Mexico through Central America. Uh, it spread through the islands of the Caribbean um, in the, the 1600s, as it says here. We've had the commercial species in Florida since at least 1910. That's our earliest recorded mention of the commercial species. And as it was spreading to the east, it was also spreading to the west. Uh, the main migratory route brings vanilla into Europe in the mid 1700s. And from there, the late 1800s, early 1900s to uh, the Southern Pacific Indian Ocean region and then to Madagascar which is today's dominant producer of commercial vanilla. And then its trans-Pacific trans route through Hawaii to the Philippines and then through the islands around Indonesia, um, which is still uh, a major producing area today. Uh, vanilla in Europe uh, is thanks to this uh, Honorable Charles Greville um, in 1807. So he was the first one that had a flowering specimen. He was proficient enough at growing orchids to keep it alive in England, and then moved through into the, the main continent of Europe, into France, uh, where they were figuring out how to artificially pollinate the vanilla flowers to get vanilla beans in um, cultivation in, uh, in greenhouses. And then in 1841, there was at the time a slave named Edmund Albius in Reunion Island, uh, who also figured out how to pollinate vanilla using uh, just a stick, um, which is now still 
the primary means of vanilla pollination in Madagascar and everywhere where there is not a native pollinator. Um, and even those areas with native pollinators still rely on artificial propagation or artificial pollination. Uh, and this is shown here uh, in Reunion, uh, what vanilla production looks like. And I'll go a little bit more into the curing of vanilla beans. So this is what Madagascar actually looks like today. Um, this is a, a jungle agroforestry ecosystem. And this is a trip I took there a couple of years ago. And uh, the, the, the vines themselves are somewhat managed. Uh, they'll grow up on, they call these Tudor trees, pretty much any tree that's growing. Uh, they'll, they'll put a vanilla vine on. And then you have this process of looping where the vine will go up five to six feet and then back to the ground where it puts out terrestrial roots. And then you do that over and over and that's how you get a very strong vanilla vine. No real uh, fertilizer application, no mulching, uh, no pesticides, fungicides, anything like that. Uh, it's just not part of their general strategy as part of a very, very low input production system. So a little bit more on what does it take to grow vanilla? Now vanilla is primarily propagated by cuttings. So you can take a section of that vine, cut it, remove the lower leaf on the vine, stick that node in the ground after the, the wound heals, and then it will root in about 10 to 14 days. And then you'll see a new growing point coming out of the, usually the highest node, depending on the health of the vine, after about 30 days. Um, but if you have a longer vine, then that plant is going to grow faster and you'll get beans sooner. Um, one of the major challenges we have is obtaining virus-free material for vanilla because with any clonally propagated crop, this is a challenge because if the mother plant has the virus, the daughter plant is also going to have the virus. Um, you can grow vanilla seeds in vitro. Uh, we would call this embryo rescue technique for any other species uh, because you do harvest the pods immature before the seed coat develops in order to germinate a high percentage of those seeds. And that will save you anywhere from 12 to 24 months um, doing it that way. And this is how we create new cultivars. Um, but this is not something that you would be able to do, say, in your backyard. You'd have to have specialized equipment in order to do tissue culture at home, which a lot of mushroom people as well as orchid people do anyway. Uh, so shown here are some long cuttings uh, on the top on this tarp, which are ready for, uh, for planting. And then on the bottom, these are uh, cuttings, uh, two node cuttings in, in pots for propagation. So relatively easy to propagate. Uh, this is part of the system we have at University of Florida at Trek, where I work. Uh, we grow on raised cypress mulch beds. Uh, why cypress? Because cypress is cheap. Um, and vanilla, as far as we can tell, doesn't really care what it's growing in as long as it's not waterlogged. And so we'll give it four to six inches of mulch. We use four by fours uh, to keep the beds tidy. And then we use a simple pole and wire trellising system. And then we, uh, in a commercial system, you would have one row. So one, one set of lines down your mulch bed. Your mulch bed should be somewhere around three feet wide. And uh, you would plant your, or space your plants at about one meter apart. So three feet apart per plant. And then you should be in production in three to four years, as long as you keep the plants healthy, you don't have freezing temperatures, things like that. Now uh, we do use supplemental overhead irrigation, especially when the plants are young. Once the plants are uh, larger, they don't need uh, the supplemental irrigation. They actually thrive well in our rainy and dry season environment. Uh, they're just, they're built for that. Uh, fertilizer. Uh, we do put down slow release once or twice a year. Um, vanilla naturally doesn't have a lot of pathogen issues as long as you start with clean material. Um, Fusarium is a problem in some areas, but uh, we control that through uh, clean material as well as reducing the amount of water stress um, on the plants and it usually tends to take care of itself. So other prediction, production systems we've We've seen around, we've got growing in a shade house like I just showed you. We're also looking at growing under post and wire under palm trees. For example, you could grow this under pretty much any type of tree that uh, gives the, the plant shade. Most orchids don't like full sun. There are exceptions, but vanilla does not handle full sun well. 
at least the commercial species. Doesn't. Uh, other areas, so in Hawaii, uh, different ways of making the beds. People grow them in pots. Some people have used cinder with slow release fertilizer, different kinds of trellises, but it's, it's all usually the same. Of You do need something for the terrestrial roots. You need something for the vines to grow up and around to loose looping. And then uh, shown here, this is uh, vanilla pompona. It's not a commercial species, uh, but it's growing on an avocado tree. Uh, vanilla would be great to pair with avocado for co-cropping because you'd have the same land. You could grow two crops either on the tree or you grow the vanilla on trellises underneath the trees. Uh, but our avocado industry is, is currently under threat from laurel wilt. And so we put out a bunch of vanilla vines on our, our uh, avocado trees here at Trek and then they, they have this laurel wilt disease and they hat rack the trees which gave the vines full sun which killed a lot of them. Um, but other than that, uh, you, we've internationally, people do grow vanilla on things like citrus or mango. Um, so there's opportunities there to grow a vine and keep it healthy on something you've already got on your land. Uh, so this is a, a short pollination video. Um, if hopefully you can see my mouse right in the middle is the pollinia or the pollen. So the male part of the flower, which is physically separated from the stigmata or the female part of a flower by this organ we call a rostellum. So in order to get a vanilla bean, you have to circumvent the rostellum to get seed development, which gives you a bean. And this is what it looks like. So you can use any stick or needle or a pen, whatever you have. And it's as simple as pushing the rostellum out of the way and letting the a pollinia um, match with the stigmata. Um, in nature, this is done by a bee that goes into, or a wasp that goes into the flower. And when it backs out, it moves that rostellum out of the way and either picks up the pollinia or at least pushes the rostellum out of the way. And then uh, you affect pollination and you get one bean per flower. Uh, harvesting beans, um, similar to things like tomatoes or mangoes, you want to leave them on the vine as long as possible. Uh, the commercial species begin to split when they're ripe, so to yellow and to split, as you can see here. And then um, that takes about eight to nine months after you have uh, uh, pollinated, depending on the weather. So to, to process vanilla beans, a, a green vanilla bean doesn't have much aroma. <clears throat> uh, just a little bit of green actually. So you have to actually cure the beans to have the aroma develop. This would be similar to, to grapes, turning grapes into raisins. So first there's a heat kill step. This is basically blanching for those of you that do any canning at home. Uh, two to five minutes, depending on the size of the bean. And you do that at 63 degrees Celsius. You then go through a process called sweating. Uh, where it's elevated temperature, and this is facilitating enzymes that are converting uh, chemicals in the bean to other chemicals that are aroma compounds. So this is where you want to make sure you don't let the beans dry out because that'll damage the enzyme. You don't want to go too hot because that'll damage the enzymes, and you don't want to go too cold because the enzymes will work slowly at lower temperatures. <clears throat> Uh, then the beans at that point, they've developed the aroma that they have the potential of developing. And then you slowly dry them down um, at 30 degrees Celsius, which is nice and warm at lower humidity, at least as low as we can get in Florida. And that takes two to four to six weeks, depending on the species and the size of the beans. At that point, the beans are shelf stable and they can be bundled in wax paper. They can be stored for a period of time as the uh, flavor continues to develop. They can be sold, or if you're in Madagascar at this point, they're shipped to the United States. Uh, the United States is the number one importer of vanilla beans followed by the European Union. Uh, shown here in the bottom, these are extra large gourmet qual or gourmet sized vanilla beans. Uh, we do our blanching in a sous vide water bath. Um, it's cheap, commercially available and food grade. We do our sweating and our drying in a proofing oven, also kitchen commercial grade. And then uh, we'll do extraction and analyze things like aroma in uh, the vanilla beans, as well as doing taste test. And this is a picture of beans bundled in Madagascar getting ready. They're in the, this is the conditioning stage, getting ready for shipping to the United States. 
There are also people online that have published a DIY sweat box. So it's just a cooler with a heating element and some racks. Um, and you, there's a website at the bottom if you want to build your own. It's, it's really just being able to maintain temperature and humidity, which you can control through bags to let the beans develop their flavor. So there are low cost options to do this at home if you wanted to go all the way to grow your own. Of course, the, the vanilla beans are great because they smell fabulous, but what we really want is to make vanilla extract. So this is how you usually see it in the store. It's a little bottle and a high price, uh, which is one reason why it's valuable for people like in growers in Florida to produce vanilla extract. Uh, if you do your own, those are more like on the, the right side where you'll have some type of jar, like a mason jar, and then you'll use your favorite brand of vodka. And uh, legally, there is a legal de definition of vanilla extract, which is here. But of course, what you do in your own home is, is up to you. Um, but legally, vanilla extract is defined as coming from only vanilla planifolia or vanilla tahitensis. And those two types have different flavor profiles, um, noticeably different. So I like vanilla planifolia, but my wife prefers vanilla tahitensis. So of course, we've got to have both in our house. Um, regardless of which type you use, um, there's a legal definition of how much bean you have to put into the solvent. And so using beans at 25% moisture, it's 13.35 ounces per gallon. Um, converting that to metric units, if anyone cares about metric, it's about 10 grams of vanilla bean at 25% moisture per 100 mils of extract. And so when you see something in the grocery store like this one that says pure vanilla extract, you know that they had to meet the legal definition of what vanilla extract. But then over the last couple of years, when vanilla prices spiked, um, these major uh, food and beverage companies, the, uh, the flavor houses weren't able to meet the consumer price point. So they started blending natural vanilla extract with artificial vanilla in. And when you do that, you can no longer call it vanilla extract because you've adulterated the extract with a synthetic ingredient. And that's where you get this blended vanilla flavor, uh, which usually consumers get confused about because what does that actually mean? And then what it means is nothing. Um, it's naturally and artificially flavored. How much of the natural product, how much of the artificial, they don't have to tell you, but legally they can't say vanilla extract unless it meets this legal definition which prohibits the use of artificial flavors. So making your own, um, you've got vanilla beans, maybe you'll buy them online, maybe you'll grow your own, you pick your favorite vodka, or if you have access to food grade ethanol, um, it's very important to make sure that you don't go online to buy denatured ethanol because denatured ethanol is not suitable for human consumption. It has methanol in it, uh, which can cause some serious problems. Those of you that, so we've been going through this, this COVID situation for years now, um, and you've seen some of the stories on hand sanitizers that are not safe for humans to use. A lot of times that's because uh, the ethanol was contaminated with methanol. So you, you don't want to put that on your hands because it's absorbed through the skin. You also don't want to drink it um, because it is a toxin. So making sure you're using something that's food grade uh, and then you'll chop up your beans and then you'll put them in a cupboard and you'll shake it every day for a month or so. And that's how you get your vanilla extract. So a little bit of uh, excitement for Southern Florida, uh, both for the commercial as well as the conservation angles for vanilla. So we have four native species in southern Florida and uh, we have naturalized planifolia as well as vanilla pompona, which is very common. So going from left to right, we have the commercial species vanilla planifolia. It has a cream green flower that doesn't open fully when mature and this is the, this is the primary commercial species. We see a lot of vanilla pompona, which is a related species, in Florida. Uh, it's, a, it's a vigorous species. This is vanilla pompona growing up a, a giant oak tree. It has a thicker stem, it has a bigger leaf, and the beans are also larger, but it has a diagnostic yellow flower. This one is not approved for food yet use in the US or the EU according to the standard of identity, but um, I have pompona extract in my kitchen and I love it. I think it, it actually tastes sweeter 
uh, at least the sensory perception is sweeter than vanilla plant folia and is consumed um, by indigenous people in Central and South America. And then we have our uh, four native species, vanilla phaantha. This is shown in the middle. This one is in the Fakahatchee. We have vanilla mexicana, which has this beautiful white labellum uh, growing in Martin County. And then we have two leafless species, uh, vanilla barbalata shown in the bottom in the far right. Uh, this is growing in the Florida Keys. And then we have vanilla deloniana, uh, which was native, or which was, did ha we did have populations of vanilla deloniana in the Everglades, uh, which is no longer the case because of illegal over collection. So now you can find it in private collections, all mostly claiming to come from Miss Lott's original cutting, uh, whatever that means. Um, and of course, because these are, these are endangered species, so we have to have permits to work with them. Uh, you can legally buy them from nurseries that are registered to sell endangered species. As long as they've registered with FDAX, they can do this, which is how we were able to obtain some of these cuttings. And then shown in the top is a picture of an orchid bead, a euglossine bee. Um, our, our native orchids are able to set beans without man, artificial pollination, manual pollination. And we're curious and currently doing research to figure out if this orchid bee is one of the, um, those insects that are responsible for um, producing vanilla pods in these natural settings, as you can see here. So we took a, a grower hobbyist survey as we're reaching out to figure out who's interested in, say, vanilla. Um, this was mostly done through the talks that, we've, that I've given over the last couple of years and those people that have joined my email list to keep in touch about vanilla progress. So almost 300 respondents from 64 cities in 29 counties. You can see the counties highlighted in the lower right for people that were interested in vanilla or at least are keeping, in, in, uh, keeping up to date with our information. Um, about a quarter of those are interested in commercial production. We also have people interested in nursery propagation as, as well as hobbyists. Most of them are small acre growers, though some have larger acreage. Um, a lot of these people already grow orchids, tropical fruit, and a number of them already have vanilla on site. A lot of that is vanilla pompona is what we're finding. And a number of them uh, are master gardeners. So maybe that's some of you. So vanilla breeding, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about our work there. So vanilla is a wild species. Um, we have around 100 species of vanilla uh, around the equator, so all around the world, though only two are approved for commercial use. But the types of vanilla that we're growing now are uh, the original clones taken from Mexico or Central America, uh, you know, over 150 years ago now, and they were massively propagated. And so we think about the risk to the industry that that is. So with uh, we've got problems with avocado right now, which is massively clonally propagated. Uh, you think about the issues we're having with banana that we had with the Gros Michel banana in the early 1900s, which led to the modern Cavendish banana, which we are now having problems with again. Uh, they call it the banana apocalypse, where Fusarium is able to infect one banana and all bananas because they're genetically identical. And vanilla is on that same precipice of uh, being so genetically identical that uh, if we have one major pathogen that can spread easily, it can threaten the entire industry. So what we're looking to is natural diversity in those populations of vanilla and how we can use that to make a more robust supply chain as well as vanilla that might taste better or grow better or more, be more disease resistant to those few clones that were cuttings that were taken out of Mexico. What does that look like historically? Uh, a long time ago, who knows how long, there was vanilla planifolia, the commercial species growing near vanilla odorata, another species. Uh, by chance, a bee or a wasp or something went to the vanilla odorata, took pollen from that plant flower, and then went and pollinated a vanilla planifolia flower. By chance, one of those pods or seeds grew to a large enough size that someone noticed it and then propagated that, and that's how we got vanilla tahitensis. So what we wanna to do today is, okay, that combination worked once, we wanna do this manually, where instead of relying on chance or bees to do the work, 
we're going to control the crosses ourselves. So we're gonna take the pollen from one good parent, put it onto the, another good parent flower. Then we're gonna grow up several hundred plants. And then we're gonna take the best from those and do this cycle over and over as we bring in different kinds of vanilla to create super vanilla plants. Similar work has been done for decades, uh, especially you can see in the grocery store for apples, right? Where you can see that there's, uh, you know, if you're lucky, six to 10 different kinds of apples, depending on your taste. Someone decades ago said, look, the red delicious apple isn't that great. We want something better. And now we have excellent apples like the pink, a pink lady apples or the, the golden or the, the honey crisp or the, the, the gala, the Fuji, et cetera. We'd like to do something similar with vanilla. Mm -hmm. What does that actually look like? So it all starts with the vanilla flower, making a pollination, growing up the seeds, which we do aseptically. So in tissue culture, um, these vanilla seeds turn into these little oniony shapes, as you can see at the top. Uh, we expose them to light, then they turn green, they grow a root, then they grow a shoot. We eventually move those out into soil. And then after a couple of years, we'll actually get beans off of those and then we'll test the extract. So it's a long process, but uh, an interesting one. So in terms of key traits, things we're interested, of course, are flavor. We want consumers to have something that they love, that they wanna keep buying. We want plants that grow quickly and that are vigorous. Um, vanilla tahitensis is 50% planifolia, but it doesn't split. So you can actually leave the pods on the, on the raceme, on the vine longer and they can develop aroma, and you could even think about sun curing at this point. Of course, we want disease resistance because nobody wants to spray fungicides or pesticides on their plants. It's expensive, it damages the environment, and we'd rather the plants took care of themselves, uh, mostly so that we can go fishing. And then uh, auto-pollination, we'd, we'd like to reduce our labor costs so that we don't have to rely on manual pollination. Some of our work developing uh, tools to help us to breed better vanilla was developing a, a vanilla genome. And a genome is all of the information in that organism. So now we can read it like a book and we can go and look at specific genes. Um, this is how we show the different chromosomes. Um, and then we can use that to relate to other species to get an idea of how long vanilla has been around and how the different species are related. Species that are more distantly related are more challenging to hybridize, even though orchids in general can make very wide hybrids. So we take all of this information. So vanilla has somewhere between 35 and 45,000 genes, and we want to know the ones that are just involved in, say, flavor. So if you think back to your biochemistry days, your chemistry days, maybe that was high school the last time you were in those classes, probably dreading them. Uh, this is a biochemical pathway. This is how a plant takes one chemical and transforms it into other chemicals. So for example, the plant here at the very top, take, at the very top takes a chemical called transcinnamic acid and converts that into lignin, which is how it makes cell walls. So this is how the plant is building itself, okay? So the plant though can also take some of those chemicals from that pathway and turn it into aroma compounds like vanilla which is the primary aroma compound in vanilla extract. So we took this pathway, we did some fancy stuff using the genome and some other tools we have, and we went from 45,000 possible genes down to what we think is the one gene that gives us vanilla. Um, this is, we call this a guilt by association analysis. We were looking for the right gene in the right place and at the right time to give us vanilla flavor. And so now, we can look at, say, a collection of a, a thousand plants, and we can do what would be like a paternity test for the plants and say, who has the best version or multiple versions of this gene? And we could predict when they're very small what they're going to be like when they're parents. It takes a lot of work, um, but at least at this point, we have a clue to help us sort through and keep just the best plants. Uh, this is what a vanilla, what vanilla extract smells like. Uh, we have a fancy machine that takes the vanilla extract and takes the different compounds in there and spreads them out. And every time there's a compound that we can detect, it makes a peak. 
So all those little spikes are different compounds. And what I'm showing here is vanilla pompona in green, vanilla planifolia, the commercial species in red, <clears throat> and vanilla tahitensis, which is a related commercial species, but it's a secondary in terms of its importance. Uh, that one's shown in blue. And so you can see uh, qualitative differences. So there are some peaks that only pompona has has, and the other species don't have them. And then you can see things like vanillin, which is the highest peak. <clears throat> There's more vanillin in both planifolia and taitensis compared to pompona. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's better, it's just different. And again, there's dozens of aroma compounds in vanilla extract, which makes it more rounded, more robust. And uh, the interplay of those compounds together give you a general perception of quality. I get this question a lot, so I made a slide specifically, <laughs> specifically to address it. Uh, is this GMO? And the short answer is no. And I have three different ways of answering it no. The short answer is no. Uh, the other answer is, can these cultivars from vanilla breeding be grown organically? The answer is yes. The long answer, though, is that everything with DNA is genetically modified. So the, the terminology here is marketing related, not science related. And that's why it's confusing. Uh, there are no GM, GMO or GE, GMO or transgenic cultivars for most crops out there. Um, so largely what you're seeing in the grocery store, especially as it relates to fresh produce, is improved through conventional means. So yes, it can be grown organically. Um, it is not genetically engineered. And so what we see though, is a lot of these types of marketing ploys where uh, you're marketing GMO or people injecting like a green sludge into a tomato. Um, that is not accurate. That's not how we make GMOs. Should we choose to make, uh, well, genetically engineered crop? And then we, we talk about people, oh, well, we can use genetic engineering to use tweezers to change DNA. That's, that's not how it works either. So that's also inaccurate. But what we're really working with is this middle ground where we appreciate what nature has already provided. And we're using that to inform the tools that we're using. And then we're selecting the best of the best. And then that's what we're giving to consumers. And that's true for most crops out there. So in conclusion, uh, so we've got a collection at the University of Florida. Um, we have almost 300 accessions, <clears throat> vanilla that we've collected from all around the world. And we're screening those now to figure out which ones grow best in Florida, which ones have the best profile, which one yields the best. And then we make those available to growers. Um, if you're interested in more of the specifics about growing in Growing vanilla in Florida, we have an EDIS document. Hopefully you know what EDIS is, but this is um, scientifically validated information for community members, growers, hobbyists, all of the above. It's freely available online. Uh, so if you Google my name, Vanilla Cultivation Florida EDIS, this document will pop up. It's available in English, Spanish, and French um, and give you some of the background information on vanilla and how to grow it in Florida. I also have an email list specifically for vanilla enthusiasts. Uh, you can feel free to, to send an email to me and I'll put you on the list if you're interested. Um, I only send out a few emails a year. That's both to respect people's time as well as the fact that I have a lot of things to do and it's, uh, we only send out um, meaningful updates uh, for vanilla. So there's fewer of them. A lot of people ask this question as well. Uh, where do I get plants? The short answer is uh, we're working on it. So there's no place you can go right now and buy 1,000 or 10,000 plants, vanilla planifolia plants that have been verified for the species and are virus free. So we've been working with tissue culture micropropagators, et cetera, and nurseries to build up stock of verified plants that grow well in Florida that we know are fruit, are uh, bean producing and that are virus free. Uh, so some of these are going to be available uh, commercially late this year, early next year. Uh, those are companies um, like Sunshine State Vanilla has a propagation effort underway, and then one through AG3 in uh, Eustis, I believe. And then down here, we have wholesalers 
um, who are propagating vanilla tahitensis, which will then hopefully go out to retailers and then um, enthusiasts can buy those for fun. Um, if you can't wait, either you have your own vine, you get it from a friend, or you go onto eBay, Etsy, or Amazon. Um, but there's a lot of buyer beware. What we're finding online is that between 10 and 15 percent, so one to two ish out of every 10 plants online for vanilla is actually the wrong species. So imagine going to the store and you want to buy a sweet orange and they give you a lime. Um, that's pretty much where we are right now with vanilla. So shown here on the bottom are a bunch of not vanilla planifolia uh, advertisements, but they're calling them vanilla. So this first one is Pompona. It's got yellow. Uh, that's pretty diagnostic. It's not planifolia. This one has more of a bell shape. This is Phaantha, a native species, which is not approved for food use. Um, you know, I don't even know what this one is, but for sure it's not vanilla planifolia. Uh, again, this one, uh, it's yellow. It's a fully open flower. It's a smaller flower. This is either a, a sick pompona or it could be palmarum. And this one, vanilla tahitensis, uh, we have never been able to confirm vanilla tahitensis purchased online is actually being tahitensis. We see a lot of people claiming to have tahitensis and it's actually either planifolia or it's phaeantha, um, which is why we're working with propagators down here to actually provide verified tahitensis so you know what you're getting. And then also by way of update, we have, uh, this is not, well, it's not sponsored by University of Florida, but this meeting is coming to Miami. This is Vanilla 2021. Um, this is sponsored by Back to Flavors. It's a global vanilla conference. It's in our backyard this year. There are virtual attendance options. Um, you can register on this website and it covers everything from production to curing, to chemistry, I'll be presenting my genomics work, and the online fee is like $100 or something. Again, it's not a UF event, um, but for those that are serious about getting into vanilla, this is a great place to start, especially because the major representatives from industry are sent. So your McCormick's, your Jividons, your IFFs, et cetera, all have representation at this conference to get the uh, most up-to-date information on vanilla. And with that, I'll thank you for your time. There's my email address. And if there's questions, I'm happy to take those according to, to Bill. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yes, there are some questions here. That was really disturbing, the last slide about purchasing vanilla orchids online and what you actually get. <laughs> yeah. And we did get, that was what several different people asked is where do I get the plants to get started? So if you are a homeowner and you are looking for reasonably legitimate plants, is there any place legitimate to purchase them online? Anybody with a fairly good reputation or is it completely buyer beware, roll of the dice? Um, in order to reduce your risk, um, again, so the, if you want something now, that's where the risk is. We are going to have verified material available in the coming months is what I anticipate. So the people are buying wholesale in the next couple of months, they'll make those available retail. Um, or if you are buying wholesale, there are options now. Um, if you want just a handful of plants, um, I would say your best, best, best bet, lowest risk would be to go onto eBay and look specifically for vanilla cutting sellers from Hawaii or Puerto Rico. Um, what we're seeing is that a lot of the people selling from Hawaii are actually growing vanilla themselves. And I would ask them, number one, to send you a picture of the flower, okay, of their, from their cutting, and two, ask if it's from a bean producing plant. Just by those two things, you can eliminate a lot of the errors that are out there and make sure when they send you a picture of the flower, it's cream green and it's, it's not fully open. My EDIS document has pictures of the most common flowers and you can just match it, right? If it's a wide open yellow flower, it's the wrong species. Okay, wow, very good advice. Uh, we have a question. How can you stimulate flowering on a vine? 
So vanilla flowers based on the biomass, right? So you can think of it like a juvenile phase for mango or an apple or whatever. Uh, you buy the tree, it takes a period of time before the tree has enough carbon in reserve that it can produce fruit without risking its own existence. Um, so with the vanilla vine, if you were able to keep that mulch substrate evenly moist, a little bit of fertilizer, whatever you want to put down, and then this looping where you let it go up five or six feet, come back to the ground, that's how you get the healthiest vine. And then it should flower after it's about 15 to 20 feet long. So that's three loops or more. And then let it go through a winter period. So a little bit less sun, a little bit less water. It should flower naturally after about three to four years, if you do that. Okay. And how would you grow it in Jacksonville? Or can uh, you? It would have to be protected culture. So yeah, vanilla is a tropical crop. It does not like cold weather, just like me. Um, so we have seen, our, so our collection has gotten down to 36 Fahrenheit. So that's just above freezing Celsius. <laughs> um, and you'll get a little bit of tip dye back, but it's usually just the, the most fresh uh, growing material, uh, part of the plant, but the vine itself can handle that for a few hours. Below freezing, I've had reports of people growing and it's been below freezing for a couple of hours at night, but there's microclimates we have to think about. So you have to protect it. Okay, yeah, we always tell people about um, if they have microclimates in their yard or a very protected spot and are able to keep it at above freezing, that helps. I know here in Hernando County, it does get to freezing or below during the winter. So we do, um, it does make growing tropical plants a little bit more difficult, but a lot of people have greenhouses, hobbyist greenhouses in their yard, so. Yeah, I know, I've actually, I've had pictures of a plant that's growing one county north of Alachua. So it all depends on winter temperatures and where your plant is. Okay, we have other people asking for about reliable sources to purchase the plant, which we already covered. Um, if you're a, so let me throw it, if, if you're a wholesaler or you're buying larger quantities of plants, so 10 to 20, I think is their minimum order, uh, Pine Island Nursery in Homestead does have verified vanilla tahitensis. So we know it's the right species. Those are the ones I bought for Trek again. And then uh, the other ones are going to be available from AG3. Uh, again, it's wholesale, but it is an option. That'll be early next year. That's plentifully. Okay, I see Randy Parr has his hand raised. So Randy, if you just go ahead and type your question in the uh, chat box, we'll get down to it. And I see more messages uh, kind of stacking up here. So you, you grow this, you grow vanilla right now down in Homestead, so you're growing it down in zone 10B because somebody asked, can this plant grow in all zones in Florida? And I guess that depends on, yes, but it depends on how, how able you are to keep it warm. Yeah, so we, our main target areas go up to say Stewart on the, uh, the east side and, um, Fort Myers, maybe Sarasota on the west side. Um, I know of a very vigorous vine on Pine Island, for example, in our native species, of course, um, through Fakahatchee and south. Um, again, it depends on how close you are to the water. It depends if you're close to a building that keeps it warm and how much risk you're willing to assume. Of course, there are areas around Lake Okeechobee on the south side that should do fine. Our, our, our general feel is if you can grow mangoes or coconut palms, then you're in a suitable climate. Otherwise, there's a level of risk, just like for other orchids. Okay, Margaret asked if you can give the name of the native vanilla cultivars again. I know that was in your presentation, but. Yep, so that's, um, it's also in our EDIS document. So we have vanilla Fayantha, uh, vanilla Barbalata, vanilla Deloniana, and vanilla Mexicana, and it's, it's all in that EDIS document as well. Okay, yeah, just look online under University of Florida EDIS, 
and you can find all the information about growing vanilla. You can find information about growing everything on EDIS. That's where all the, the researchers' fact sheets are all located. Um, Lucy says, awesome presentation, very complete, clear, easy to understand for beginners. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Is it better to start with a 10 foot vine or 10 one foot vines? Yeah, so that's it comes into carbon partitioning. We haven't actually figured out which is actually best. Usually the recommendation is if you start with a one meter long cutting, so three feet, um, that's a, that reduces the shock to the plant, but also gives it a lot of biomass that reduces about one year of your wait time before you're producing a bean. So you can do as, as small as two nodes, which is like 10 centimeters. Uh, what's that in inches? It's like eight inches or something. Mm -hmm. Or um, one meter is, if you could get a one meter cutting, that's probably what I would do if I was doing this commercially. Okay, and Lucy also asks, why are some species not approved for the food industry? Is that because they're, they just haven't approved them yet or there's an issue or a problem with them? There's, there's a couple of things going on. So the standard of identity limits first, right, as we discussed, and that was in response to adulterated products coming out of Mexico, primarily. Uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, where the industry said we have to have protection because they were putting things, some unscrupulous sellers were putting uh, solvents into extract you should never put into your body. So that's why we even have the standard of identity. The other species, I mean, so we have some species that are consumed at a local level through Central and South America. That's like the Pampona. This is a, sorry, I guess they're mowing the lawn today. Oh. Um, so vanilla Pampona has been consumed locally for hundreds of years. And so that one I think is lower risk, even though it's outside the legal definition. Then there are some species that are also are non-aromatic. So the beans don't have any aroma. So there's really no reason you would want to eat those. And then those that are, again, the reason we know food is safe is because so many people have eaten so many things for such a long time. Um, new food, there are risks there that we can't predict until a large section of the population has consumed something and not had a reaction. Um, so we have that risk where we're not going to be pushing a lot of these other species, because I'm not a food toxicologist, but I certainly don't want to make anybody sick. Okay. And how many pounds can be grown or produced per acre commercially? Yeah. So if you look on our, our EDIS document, we have some of the basic economics, but you're looking at around 0.5 kilograms of cured vanilla beans per plant. And your planting density is, it's usually advertised as a thousand plants per acre. But what we're looking at in intense culture in South Florida is probably five times that. So we're looking at around 5,000 plants per acre at 0.5 kilograms of cured bean per plant. But we also think the 0.5 is, is un, unnecessarily conservative um, because what you can do in a jungle system versus a managed and maintained plot is very different in terms of total yield. Okay, and somebody in Pasco County asks, would I be able to overwinter a vanilla orchid outdoors? What is the lowest temperature they would be okay with? We certainly want to keep them above freezing because we will see damage in the high 30s, 30s Fahrenheit. Um, so you probably still have to bring it inside. And what is the minimum number as a general rule for wholesale purchases typically? Um, if you're buying from a company like AG3, it's usually one flat, which is 72 plants, which is going to cost you around 100 bucks. Um, and then Pine Island is selling for somewhere between 10 and 12 dollars per plant, and I can't remember what their minimum was. It, it was 10, 20, somewhere in there plants. But uh, the ones available at Pine Island now are also about two and a half feet long, so they're they're bigger plants. So it's and you're buying time with those ones because they're much larger, whereas coming out of agri-starch or AG3, they're usually four-inch plants. Okay. And in colder areas like Hernando County, could you grow them 
in a cover place like a porch or sunny room? Uh, they, probably. They okay, semi indoors. I mean, so there are once, especially once the plants is, the younger plants, of course, are more sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and this is, we actually had a study. We were going to send plants throughout the state to see how they did this last winter. We bought a bunch of plants and found out that all of them were infected with Cymbidium mosaic virus. So, <laughs> and that was from a commercial propagator. So, of course, we got upset, but mm -hmm. then we, we didn't feel right about sending infected material all over the state. And so that's going to cost us about two years because now we have to get clean material out, have someone else propagate it, buy that material, and then make that available to people. So we have the same risk that everyone else has, but right now we just, you, you can only do this empirically. You take the plant you put it somewhere and you see if it lives or dies. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so do vanilla bean orchids have a production lifespan if the growing conditions are met and the best number of plants or what's the best number of plants a hobbyist would need to produce a few bottles of vanilla a year? Um, okay, so the, for the, the productive life, so vanilla, because you're always actively growing from one end, you always have brand new tissue, year old tissue, et cetera. So if you take care of the vines and you're able to keep virus out, which is pretty much only spread mechanically. So if you keep it out, it stays out. Um, that vine should be good indefinitely. Um, and, and if you want to get rid of old stuff, you just take cuttings of your best material and you get rid of the old stuff and you keep going. And then, I mean, you want a couple of bottles. Uh, half a kilogram of beans will make you a couple liters of extract, no problem. So wow. if you've got a, even just a couple of very healthy vines, you should get a decent number of beans for, for home use. But of course, there's never enough vanilla, so more is better. Exactly. <laughs> and then once your family and friends find out about it, they're going to want some too. So they make great gifts around holidays. <laughs> How many hours of sun do they need? Uh, yeah, so one more. We don't have hard data on it, but I mean, vanilla is native to areas around the tropics. So you're looking at 12 ish. <laughs> um, they do well in South Florida, though. So they, I mean, they are doing just fine in our semi-tropical area. Um, the big thing that we're, so that we're more concerned about not providing full sun when they are getting sun. So reducing light by about 70%. Um, and then the plants, they'll go into a semi-dormant state in the winter. They grow, but just not as fast. And they, again, but that's also a good time for the plant to stimulate flowering. So mm -hmm. you're just fine. Okay, and here's a good question. Are there extension programs or grants to help get small scale operations started? Yeah, I wish there was more of that. Getting into agriculture is something you either did 50 or 100 years ago, or you have to have a second job or a real, you know, a <laughs> primary job and growing is secondary. <clears throat> um, I've had people ask, I'm not aware of any, I know of. Uh, you know, small companies that can get research grants, but I don't know about any that actually enable people to get into agriculture. Yeah, um, sure. I would recommend contacting USDA. They have, you know, small farmer and beginning farmer programs, loan programs, things like that. But there's nothing specific for vanilla yet. And is it possible to get contact information for the Pine Island and the AG3 growers? Yeah, so just, just email me. Um, and I had a direct message for Pine Island. So I talked both about Pine Island near Fort Myers, which is where I know vanilla is growing, a commercial species. I've got a contact out there. And then Pine Island Nursery is in Homestead. And they're the ones that are... Um, selling tahitensis, verified tahitensis right now. Other people might be selling them, but if they don't tell me, then I, I don't know. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, amazing information that was well presented. Thank you. Um, how do you know if a plant has a virus or it is virus free? Well, we ac you actually have to do the test. Mm -hmm. um, so our major virus right now of concern is Cymbidium mosaic virus and Agdia has a immunostrip. 
kit that you can buy. Oh, okay. For a homeowner, it doesn't make a lot of sense um, unless you've got a big plant that you want to keep because the test can cost between five and ten dollars, which is the same price as a new plant. Um, so it's it's a trade-off for us. It's research related and it's curation and co you know uh, conservation related. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's a fixed cost. Okay, and one last question here. Other than collection restrictions, are there other regulations to be aware of regarding the endangered natives if you wanted to grow them? Now you certainly can. My understanding is we're working with FDAX is that um, nurseries or, or sellers, they, they, they can get registered. What they, want, what they want is to prevent people from going into natural areas and removing endangered material. But there's material in artificial propagation systems now, which you can propagate and sell legally using the let FDAX know. Um, of course, I don't know a lot of people that you can show up in their place and be like, hey, are you certified with FDAX to whatever? Um, it's kind of, again, it's a buyer beware type of situation. I just know that it is possible to sell those plants if they've taken care of what they need to to make sure they're not taking it out of natural areas. Um, for a homeowner, where your risk is at, and I'm not a lawyer, it's probably low. For someone like me, I need to make sure that I did it right so I have permits so I don't get in trouble. Okay. Okay, well, that's about all the questions here. So uh, thank you very much. That was really great. Uh, let me go ahead and um, you have your email address on there. And I put in the chat box earlier a link to our webpage where people could check to see all of our other upcoming classes and our um, a link to our Facebook page. And I believe I put um, my email in there also. Let me go ahead and put that in there to everybody. So if anybody has any further questions, feel free to get in contact with me get in contact with Dr. Chambers. We're always happy to help. And we will definitely have to have you come back. I think maybe we'll go cover papayas next time because I know that you're doing a lot of really interesting work on papayas and they are fairly easy to grow for most people and you could be pretty successful with them also. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Let me go ahead and stop the recording.